Okay, folks, let's get started. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Santa Claus has come to town. And you know what Santa does with naughty kids? He gives them finals. <laughs> he gives them very evil finals is what he does, okay? So look out for Santa Claus. He's really a, really a bad guy. Uh, let's see. Let's think about a couple of things in terms of announcements. And we have a couple surprises today, one of which is standing in front of you with all this on. And there's more surprises as well. Um, let's see. First of all, uh, this is not a surprise. It's been announced on the web page. But I'll remind you that we have a review session tonight at 6.30 in ALS 4001. So I will videotape that and I will uh, get it posted uh, maybe later this evening, but most likely sometime tomorrow. Okay? Uh, and that's there. For those of you who had regrades on exams, um, they are available for pickup in the BB office and you can pick them up there. So that's um, available to you. And last but not least, we have a final exam I have heard. And the final exam is in this room on Monday at 9.30 a.m. So uh, get here in plenty of time. Remember to position yourselves with seating, as I said before. So we sit in the odd numbered seats. Number one right here, number one right here, and number one on that row over there. Same thing is true if you sit up above, okay? Uh, and uh, you will get a full hour and 50 minutes to take uh, the exam. Um, and uh, what's it gonna say? Um, it's got 150 points. Okay, so I've written the exam. It has 150 points. It has um, the first section, which is the short answer, has 75 points. That's half of the exam. The second section, which is the problem solving section, has 36 points. And the last section, which are the longer answer, has 39 points. Now, it hasn't been duped yet, so there may be some changes. And one of those changes I'm kind of going to decide today is, will we have an extra credit question or not? I don't know. So maybe you guys can help convince me today that we should have an extra credit question. I see some, well, well, nodding yes doesn't do it. It's got to be, no, no, that's OK. I'm not, I'm not waiting for applause or anything here. I, I think you know what I like to, to have when it comes to extra credit, right? So we'll. We'll see how that plays out. There might be some music today. I don't know. So that's, that's, that's possible. OK? Um, let's see. So that's basically it. Uh, the, the format, as I said, is the same as before. The point changes are different. There are three questions in section two. And there are three questions in section three. OK? And there are 25 questions in section one. If that tells you anything. And uh, people always say, is it hard? Is it easy? Do I make them harder, et cetera? And the answer is, I, I can never tell. I never would have guessed the last exam that the average would be 76.5. So I was very pleased. So I'm probably the last person you want to ask if an exam is hard or easy. I always try to write them in the same way. I always do. Okay? And I think this looks like, a, like an average exam in that respect. If you did not get a note card on uh, Wednesday when I passed them out, uh, I don't have them here. You'll have to come to my office to get them from me. I will remind you that with the exam, you have to turn in a note card that you got from me. Okay? You have to turn in a note card that you got from me. Even if you don't use it or you don't plan to use it, you need to turn that note card in with your exam with your name on it. So if you don't have one, make sure that you get one to turn in. And no, I won't bring them to the exam. All right? So you want to? Yeah? How do you know they're Well, if I told you how I knew they were mine, then that would kind of give it away, wouldn't it? Yeah. So I know which ones are mine. All right, so make sure that you bring an, a note card that I gave you to the exam. If you don't, or use a different card or something, you will lose points. And again, I need to make sure that you're using these cards and you're not passing them on to your roommates because that's, that's important um, for them to have the benefit of filling out their cards next term or next year, whatever. OK, we don't have an awful lot more to do. That's very good. So we'll have. Uh, in fact, if I finish early, which I uh, might, I don't know, we will, uh, I'll, I'll take a few questions relative to the review session, and we will have a nice surprise at the very end. So that's uh, all in, in store today. Okay. Now, um, I've had several questions from, I've had several questions from people about 
this rather confusing regulation of glycogen phosphorylase. And so I just want to take a couple minutes and sort of summarize that for you, okay? So glycogen phosphorylase is uh, an enzyme that's regulated in several ways, all right? So when we talk about covalent modification, it exists in two forms. It exists in the glycogen phosphorylase A form, which is the form that has the phosphate on that people describe as the more active, and it has the form without the phosphate, known as the glycogen phosphorylase B, that people describe as less active. Okay? Um, the reason people describe glycogen phosphorylase A as the more active form is that usually in the cell, when it's present, it's present in the R state. Because only when glucose is present will it get converted to the T state. If glucose is not present, or if glucose is present in very, very low quantities, then there will be no glycogen phosphorylase A in the T state. R state, of course, being the much more active form. Glycogen phosphorylase B, on the other hand, okay, is much more likely to be found in the T state. Right? To convert glycogen phosphorylase B into the R state requires what? AMP, okay? It requires AMP. And that isn't, again, very common inside of cells. Only when cells are really, really low in energy are they going to have much in the form of AMP. On the other hand, ATP and glucose 6-phosphate convert it into the T state quite readily. And those are usually fairly abundant, okay? Glucose 6-phosphate, okay? Now, so... Those things all come together. Now, again, I'm not going to ask you to rank them or do complex scenarios with these. That's not the point of telling you all that information. <laughs> but it is important that you understand all those different types of regulation. It's very important that you understand those different types of regulation and what's there. So the phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, of course, involve a kinase or a phosphatase. Right? The R and T involve allosteric effectors. Okay? All right. Okay, so that's uh, where we start. Now, um, there's a couple things about regulation that we haven't talked about. And you think, oh my God, it's already, you know, murderous, right? Well, there's a nice organizing scheme to it. The organizing scheme that we've seen is that, in general, phosphorylation of proteins is favoring the breakdown of glycogen and the stopping of synthesis of glycogen in general, okay? We phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylate. We, we, first, we, we, we phosphorylate phosphorylase kinase. What does it do? Well, it turns around, makes it active, and it phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase B to A. What does glycogen phosphorylase A do? It breaks down glycogen. Protein kinase A can also phosphorylate... Protein kinase A can also phosphorylate glycogen synthase. That converts it into the inactive form, the synthase B, because now it can't make glycogen. That makes sense. Breakdown and making, we don't want having going on at the same time. Dephosphorylation, on the other hand, favors, okay, in general, again, these are general things, in general, dephosphorylation favors synthesis of glycogen and inhibition of glycogen breakdown. Now lay out the schemes yourself and see that and it will make sense, I think, to you. All right. Well, what we haven't talked about hardly at all is that dephosphorylation. And dephosphorylation has to itself be regulated, just like everything else has to be regulated, because if we don't regulate it, then everything's going to be dephosphorylated all the time and cells aren't going to have energy like they need. Okay? So we need to think about that dephosphorylation, and that's the wrong slide. Okay. Here's what we're after. Okay. Now, what you see on the screen is a, um, a scheme that shows the regulation of phosphoprotein phosphatase. That's the PP1. Okay. PP1, what we're looking at here, M stands for muscle. So what we're looking at is a scheme that exists in muscle. All right, well, what does this tell us? It tells us, first of all, that PP1 is bound to another protein 
And the unfortunate name is this protein is called G sub M in this case. And we'll call it G sub M. That's not a G protein. We've used the term G protein before to refer to proteins that bind to guanosine nucleotides. This is not a G protein. It's just holding on to phosphoprotein and phosphatase. Uh, ph phosphoprotein phosphatase, OK? Now, what happens? Well, this phosphatase has to be regulated, OK? When this phosphatase is in linked to GM, as you see it here, it is the most active, OK? It is the most active. So we're starting out over here. We're in a situation where we haven't been doing anything, and then all of a sudden we get our epinephrine. So we're going to follow from left to right what happens when epinephrine gets uh, bound by the cell surface receptor. All right? So we've got an active PP1, and we're going to ultimately convert it over here on the other side to an inactive form. This is the most active form. All right. Well, and again, we're looking in muscle. What happens is when we have epinephrine being synthesized, we see that this protein GM gets phosphorylated. It's phosphorylated by, there's our friend, protein kinase A again. Phosphorylation of GM causes it to let go of PP1. Now that actually makes PP1 less active. It's most active when it's bound to GM. It is less active when it's been released. It's still active, but it's not as active as it was over here. Okay. What else happens? Well, look what protein kinase A does. Protein kinase A phosphorylates the inhibitor. This is an inhibitor of the enzyme over here. No inhibition. Over here, the inhibitor gets phosphorylated, and that makes it a perfect binding molecule for the phosphatase. In this state over here, it's blocking the active site, and the phosphatase is completely inhibited. So why is this significant? Well, let's think about this. When I said we do phosphorylation, we want to favor the breakdown of glycogen, right? If we want to favor the breakdown of glycogen, we're putting phosphates onto things. We sure as heck don't want <laughs> phosphoprotein phosphatase 1 taking phosphates off of things, right? Because if this is active, we put a phosphate onto glycogen phosphorylase A, this guy is going to turn around and take it right off. So this one system, protein kinase A, by going out and phosphorylating all these proteins, is favoring completely the breakdown of glycogen. It's stopping the reversal of that process, that is the removal of the phosphates from those proteins. Now, I know that's a little confusing, okay? So I'm going to stop and take questions relevant to that. Or give you a moment to digest it, perhaps. Nobody has any questions. Yeah? So this is consistent with the breakdown of glycogen, and it's stopping, that is, the reversal of that breakdown, those breakdown enzymes. Okay? Those breakdown enzymes are favored by phosphorylation. The synthesis enzymes are inhibited by phosphorylation. As long as those phosphates are sitting on those enzymes, we're going to be breaking down glycogen, and this keeps that reversal from happening, that is, the taking the phosphates off. <coughs> Now, when insulin comes along, I don't have a scheme to show you, insulin is going to stimulate a different phosphatase that's going to take this phosphate off, and everything's going to go back over to the left. <coughs> when everything goes back over to the left, you can see what's going to happen. We're going to start taking phosphates off of everything. When we take phosphates off of everything, glycogen synthesis will be favored. Glycogen breakdown will be inhibited. Okay. We're almost there. There's one other surprising thing that shows up. Yeah, Connie? So insulin um, moves the phosphate from the inhibitor and the GM, or just the inhibitor? Insulin doesn't do anything except stimulate processes in the cell. Remember, okay. insulin is binding to, the, to a receptor outside the cell. Insulin doesn't come in. So insulin is stimulating a process that will ultimately result in the removal of this phosphate. Yeah, this one as well. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I didn't say that. But this this phosphate as well. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty cool. 
pretty darn cool. Now, there's one last really interesting and odd thing about glycogen metabolism, and then we'll actually be done with the regulation, all right? And that's right here. This was a really big surprise. Somebody takes out, and they're really interested in studying glycogen phosphorylase A. They're interested in studying uh, uh, glycogen synthase. And they put them in the same tube. I've got purified, pure glycogen phosphorylase. I've got pure glycogen synthase. I put them together in a tube, and I want to see what happens. I add glucose, and something very odd happens. I see that by the addition of glucose, the breakdown of glycogen phosphorylase, I'm sorry, the conversion of glycogen phosphorylase A to B occurs, and the, break, the conversion of glycogen synthase B to A occurs. What does it take to have that happen? What does it take to convert this guy to this guy or this guy to this guy? What's happening there? The first person that answers that gets a free Metabolic Melodies calendar for 2012. <laughs> Are they different active sites in the same molecule? Nope. What'd you say? Dephosphorylation. Come by and get your calendar, OK? It's Santa Claus is here, OK? All right. So dephosphorylation is happening, but I only had two enzymes here. How do I get dephosphorylation? I have a free Metabolic Melodies CD for the person who answers that. <laughs> What's that? One of them does what? One dephosphorylates the other. The answer is no. If anybody read ahead in their notes, they'd know. Yeah. Read the question. Say the question again. Okay. How does that dephosphorylation happen? Nobody read ahead in the notes. Oh man. Okay. I'm going to have to tell you. You guys are going to miss a valuable. You, uh, you could sell this on eBay. CD, you have. You have a, does, um, does it synthesize glycogen using the phosphorus? Does it synthesize glycogen using the phosphorus? No, it doesn't. Okay. All right. Boy, that's, I figured somebody would jump up at that one. It's actually on the next slide. Okay. It turns out glycogen phosphorylase A in the liver carries around with it, look what it's holding on to. It's actually holding on to this G in the liver that has the phosphoprotein phosphatase. All right? When this guy is in the R state, this is blocked. Nothing can get in there, and the phosphatase is inhibited. When this is in the R state, that's what happens. What does adding glucose to glycogen phosphorylase A do? It converts it to the T state. And when it converts it to the T state, look what happens. It lets go of this guy. So when it lets go of this guy, this guy is just like the one with the GM. It's completely active. And what does it start doing? It starts taking those phosphates off. Now, glycogen phosphorylase A gets converted to glycogen phosphorylase B. Glycogen synthase B gets converted to glycogen synthase A all by dephosphorylation. That's pretty darn cool. Right? Now, why is that important? Why is that important that this thing carries this thing around with it? Any thoughts about that? Should I put a CD out for that? There's a very important reason why this guy carries this around. Your book actually talks about it. Nobody's read the book. This is quite the class been all term. All right. So why are, why are cells breaking down glycogen? Why are they doing this? They need energy. And why do they? What's their typical needs for energy? Quick, quick, running from the grizzly bear, right? Or the teacher that has, is wearing a hat. That's right. Either, either way. OK? I want this quick, which means I want to break things down quick. And what did we learn earlier in the term about enzymes with respect to speed? They work very fast. Yes, OK, that's good. What else did we learn? What did I say about driving your Maserati to Fred Meyer? 
you got to control them, right? If you turn something on and it's really powerful and it's going to break things down really quickly, don't you want to be able to turn it off really quick? Carrying this, carrying around its own inhibitor is the most efficient way that it can turn itself off really quick. Now, notice this happens in the liver. This is happening in the liver. The liver is producing what? What's one of the things that the liver produces that only one other tissue produces? Glucose. Okay. So let's think what the, what the liver is doing. The liver is sitting there. This guy is dumping epinephrine. It's making, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, I've got to get it right now. He's, he's uh, making epinephrine. So two things are happening. One is glucose, one phosphate is being produced by the breakdown of glycogen. The other thing that's happening is gluconeogenesis is being stimulated. Both of those converge in the synthesis of glucose. One's a breakdown, one's a synthesis process, but they're both producing the same thing, which is glucose. What's the liver doing with that glucose? Where's the, where's the glucose going? Exporting. It's exporting. It's dumping out of the liver into the bloodstream. And what's happening when it gets in the bloodstream? It. it goes to tissues that need it. And when I stop exercising, my tissues don't need it. What happens? Blood glucose levels start going up, right? Do I want my blood glucose levels to go up? No. no. So when my blood glucose levels go up, what starts happening to my liver's ability to push out glucose? I don't want to push out anymore, right? So now the liver stops pushing out glucose, and what happens to the concentration of glucose in the liver cell? Up, and that's what we see right here. This stops the liver from making too much glucose, and it stops it very, very quickly. Glucose is a poison. We're avoiding the poison with this very, very rapid control that we've got here. It's a very, very important point. Okay? Everybody understand what I've just told you? So being able to carry around its own off switch allows this guy to merrily go along its way, cutting through that glycogen like butter. But once this starts to accumulate, it literally gets turned off by the very thing that it's carrying, that phosphatase. The phosphatase, in turn, activates glycogen synthase. And what's that going to do with the glucose? It's going to make it into glycogen, ultimately, right? And what's that going to happen to the concentration of glucose in the cell? It's going to fall. We've just reduced the amount of poison. OK? Make sense? Clear as mud? Yes, sir. Clear as mud. You ever notice how you get the end of the term and your voice starts going up? Mine does. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but that's what happens to my voice. Okay, I've got one last thing to show you, and maybe one more chance for somebody to win a, C a very valuable CD. I will autograph these for you. You can sell them on eBay. <laughs> I, you know, you don't know how much you might make from your knowledge here. Okay, so knowledge is power. Knowledge may be money. So. You might meet some exciting people from having these things too. You never know. Hey, come over to my house. We can listen, right? Or come watch me turn the page of the calendar over. That's what you're going to say, right? So. <laughs> okay. Um, glycogen storage disease, all right? So when we think about enzymes and we think about metabolism and we think about reactions, we always think about, well, what happens when things don't work? What happens when we have problems? Well, it turns out that there are a variety of what are called glycogen storage diseases. And these diseases arise as a result of deficiency of certain enzymes either in that pathway or related to that pathway. Okay? So uh, there are several of these. Von Gierke's disease, uh, they, this one lacks a glucose 6-phosphatase and affects liver and kidney. And what happens to the glycogen? Well, it's got an increased amount of glycogen, but it has a normal structure. Well, that sort of makes sense because this doesn't build glycogen. It's involved in doing other things. What's this guy involved in doing? Anybody remember? Nobody's going to say until I say, well, how about a CD, right? <laughs> gluconeogenesis, that's right. Okay. So gluconeogenesis can affect glycogen metabolism. All right. So we may see some problems arising from that. Here's Pompe's disease. It's lacking alpha-1,4 glucosidase. Okay. And oh, my, this is not going here. Uh, 
The one I want to talk about, the one I think is the most interesting, is actually McArdle's disease. Gesundheit, wow. Uh, it's, it's a deficiency of glycogen phosphorylase. Now, you think about this and you think, how can a person be deficient in glycogen phosphorylase and be alive? Right? Well, it turns out that this uh, disease is, um, makes, it's possible for a person to be alive by virtue of the fact that it only affects muscle cells. That is, only the muscle cells are lacking the glycogen phosphorylase. All right? Lacking glycogen phosphorylase, what happens when we look at the glycogen there, it's got a moderately increased amount, not surprising because this is what breaks glycogen down. It's got a relatively normal structure, meaning we've got branching enzyme and all that other stuff that's there. Okay? But what's surprising is it has fairly limited effects. Limited ability to perform strenuous exercise because of painful muscle cramps. Otherwise, patient is normal and well-developed. A person lacking glycogen phosphorylase in their muscle loses ability to do strenuous exercise, but that's the main thing. If we look at what happens with the thing, here's, here's a, a plot of the concentration of ADP. That's what we get from the breakdown of ATP. Okay, uh, For a person who has uh, McArdle's disease, all right, and uh, this person is doing, this, this is a person who doesn't have McArdle's disease, this person has McArdle's disease. Look at the levels of ADP. You rest, your levels are low, you do some exercise, your ADP levels stay fairly constant. The person with McArdle's disease sees ADP levels go high, and then it falls, meaning that the cells are catching up and making ATP. Now, for that last chance at a CD, my question to you is, What's making this possible? It's something we learned during the term. Something we learned, a very important process, I'll give you a hint, a very important process we learned during the term that allows these people who have this disease to lead a fairly normal life. Any guesses? Yes? Is that going to be fermentation resulting in lactate? Is that going to be fermentation resulting in lactate? It could be slightly, but no, that's not the right answer. It's the Cori cycle. Right. What does the Cori cycle do? The liver has a normal enzyme, right? And so when the muscles start running out of energy, what happens? Oh, wow, we need some glucose. They can't get glucose from breaking down of glycogen, but the liver sure as heck can do that, and the Cori cycle kicks in. Okay? So in essence, it's a, a backwards thing to the lactate that you talked about but it's the fact that the phosphorylase in the liver is perfectly normal. That makes sense? You guys look like you're ready for the surprise or something. Okay, yes, sir? Is this something that's easily diagnosed? I think it would be fairly easily diagnosed. I, I, I'm not a physician, so I don't know. I, I would think it would be fairly easy to diagnose because it would manifest itself pretty readily in the fact that you're really just, you know, as, as a kid... You're going to have problems with exercise, and you're just worn out with this. So yeah, I think it would be fairly easy to, to detect that. Other questions? I need to look in the back of the room and see if my surprises are ready yet or not. Are the surprises ready? Are, are the surprises ready? Oh, OK. Are you ready for a surprise? Yes. Okay, at this point you can put your pens down, your pencils down, because we're not going to do anything more that's going to be on the exam. It'll be fun. And if you really don't want to hear some bad singing, you can leave also. So uh, I will tell you that. There's going to be some <coughs> singing. Well, this is a little bit different singing than you've heard before. Okay? So um, you guys know I like the Beatles. I write a lot of stuff to Beatles music. And... You know, the Beatles were like this, but I really think they should have been like this, you know? I mean, if this were an ideal world, that's what it would have looked like, you know? They may not have sold as many of billions of records as they did, but anyway. So, as I was putting this together, I sat and I thought about, you know, the Beatles and so forth. And then I thought, you know, that's really odd. You know, there's, there's all these things out there that relate to music that involve the letter B. Okay, So the Beatles, I mean, they were, wow, what awesome things. And you guys aren't old enough, but what succeeded the Beatles was this group called the Bee Gees. Anybody hear the Bee Gees? Oh, you heard of the Bee Gees. Okay, so it's night fever, night fever, right? Okay, so, 
Anyway, and what succeeded the Bee Gees was a really important group known as, right? <laughs> the Backstreet Boys. What a group, huh? And of course, what succeeded them, we know, of course, was, um, <coughs> yeah, was a low moment in music, I think. But if you thought you've seen low moments in music, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let me introduce the next bees that are going to turn the music world upside down. To the Biocomical Choir, please come down. I have some people to help me sing today, so they're going to drown me out. Yes, applause is appropriate. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me introduce our participants, including one person in the class, starting with Santa on the end. This is Bonnie. This is Heather. This is Kari, Shannon, Indira, Andrea, Valeria, and Linda. So uh, thank them all for, uh, thank you all for coming to help me with this. I thought about, you know, introducing them. You know, we think about flash mobs. I thought maybe we could just call these guys the world's first flush mob. You know, but that might be a little mean, so I didn't do that. So, okay. So then we're going to do some of Britney's favorite hits. We're, oops, we're going to do it again. And you guys know the rule about singing loud, right? Okay, so we have four songs for you today that we're going to sing. Yeah, and they're going to sing with you. Yes, this, this group has questions, you see. You guys don't ask me questions. My group up here asks me questions, so this is, this is good. Now, the first song that we think about is the fact that how many people in here are really sick and tired of that sunshine? There we go. Okay, these are the real Oregonians in the room, okay? So... We're sick and tired of that sunshine. We don't want that sunshine anymore. Please join us in singing our first big hit known as Let It Rain. <laughs> oh, the Oregon weather's dowdy Cause the sky is mostly cloudy You can't stop it if you complain So let it rain, let it rain, let it rain It doesn't show signs of slowing and it's ready right for snowing And it's driving some folks insane Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain When it finally turns out dry We'll be putting away our rain gear It will probably be July But I'll surely miss the reindeer Cause the sound of the falling rain Pitter paddling down the train Makes music inside my brain So let it rain, let it rain, let it rain Okay, I couldn't quite hear you guys. Heather is going to pick the key for the Heather will pick the key. <laughs> okay, I've been told I'm not picking the key on the next one, so okay. <laughs> We have someone here who's much more musically talented than I. In fact, I should put the microphone with her. Perhaps we do that. Whoa. I'm destroying all my equipment here. All right. So let me put... Oh, I'm not... I don't want you don't want that? Okay. All right. Maybe I'll just hold it close to you. All right. All right. The, the next song. Um, we learned a lot during the term about hemoglobin. You heard a lot about what happens in the blood and how all those things work. It's appropriate that we talk about the bloody things. Okay? <laughs> this is an old song that many of you may not know, and some people My here may not know. Yes. I grew up with this ad. It's an old Coca-Cola ad. It goes. I'm gone. Oh, it's Heather, sir. Let's put, put some oxygen beside my poor friend Reeves to nudge the irons up a notch and yank on his studies. The globe and shapes will change a bit. Oh, what a sight to see. The way they bind to oxygen cooperatively. And as I exit from the lungs to swim in the bloodstream, metabolizing cells, they all express their needs to me. To them I give up oxygen and change from R to T. While my knees they hang on to 
the protons readily. But that's not all the tricks I know. There's more that's up my sleeve. By gaps between subunits that hold two, three, B, B, G. When near metabolizing cells, I find things that diffuse. The protons and bicarbonates from lowly CO2. That's the way it is. When your cells are at play, go say hip hip hooray. For the bloody things. All right. Two down. Okay. The next one may sound a little familiar to you, and with good reason. So I, I, this one I expect to hear a lot of voices on. It's about serine proteases. All right. Heather, start us. Go, go for it, Heather. All serine proteases. Work almost identically, using amino acids, try it catalytically. First they find peptide substrates, holding on to them so tight, changing their structure when they get them in the S1 side. Then there are electron shifts. Happy at this side. Searing gives up its proton as the reaction goes on. Next the oxide ion beats so electron rich. <laughs> Grabs the tight carbon view room. Breaks its bond without a hitch. So one piece is bound to it. The other gets set free. Water has to act next to let the final fragment loose. Then it's back where it started. Wait for a peptide chain that it can bind itself to. Go and start all over again. Okay. Now. About you guys, but I don't. I can't really hear them much out here. You know? Do you notice? And I don't know. I didn't tell, but they got a, a, on the final exam. If they want to have an extra credit question, that one of the rules was I had to really be able to hear. You know, <laughs> like loud, <laughs> like louder than you've sung before. <laughs> okay. You do know, you will know the last one. It's a, it's a very easy Christmas tune. It's to the tune of Winter Wonderland, okay? It's a song I wrote about this class. We sang it last year, and I can tell you the group that sang it last year, they were magnificent. The bar is very high. Very high, okay? Are we going to belt it out? Yes! I can't hear you! Yes! All right, all right, let's go with it. It's called BB Wonderland. Heather, take us. No, we're all starting. This. All right, ready? Okay. One and a two, two and, and a three. Milam Hall, it's 1230. And they heard it wordy. He walks to and fro while not talking slow. Giving it to BB450. Louder. I was happy when the turn just started. And she knows the video's galore. MP3's got added to my iPod. The sun's and stations sometimes were a bore. And exams get me to help me when the curve turned out ugly. I don't think it's so. My scores are too low. Sliding by BB450. Finally, there's an examination on December 5th at 8 a.m. I'll have my car packed with information so I don't have to memorize it then. And I'll feel like a smarty with my jam pad, no party. Just one more to go, and then ho, 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 I'll be done with me before my go. All right, I think you got it. Thank you, thank you, 
see you on Monday, if not soon. Thanks, guys. Oh, yes, thank you, man. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> If, if you're too crowded for the final and I don't get a chance to say it, I hope you have a great holiday. Thank you. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Indeed. You too. Study hard, okay? <laughs> Go to the other side. How you doing? Uh, they're back in my office. I'll come back and see you in my office. Okay? Uh, I'm going there in a minute. Yeah, i got to take everything down. But yeah.